Hi everyone, we're Maddie and Gus, and today we're going to be talking about the importance of soil science. Hooray! Let's get into it. You all probably know that soil is everywhere, but what exactly is it? Soil is a combination of minerals, organic matter, water, and air. Minerals, like clay and quartz, are the individual materials that make up rocks. Organic matter is anything that is or was part of an organism, from plant roots and fallen leaves to the small critters that live in or on the soil itself. Soil water isn't like the water we drink. It contains nutrient molecules and colloids, which are tiny specks of minerals or organic matter stuck in the water. Soil air is pretty different from the air we breathe. Although it has about the same amount of nitrogen as our atmosphere, the amounts of oxygen, water vapor, and carbon dioxide vary dramatically from soil to soil. The ratios and types of these components change depending on the soil's location and the region's climate, relief or topography, organisms, parent material, and time how long the soil has existed. Those differences result in different taxonomies or types of soil. Soil scientists can determine what type of soil exists in a region by digging a pit and looking at the profile. Take a look at this gelisol, a soil that forms in arctic tundra regions. Gelisols have lots of intact organic matter since the freezing cold temperatures prevent decomposition. Oxisols, on the other hand, form under tropical rainforests. They contain almost no organic matter and are mostly made of oxide compounds like rust. Which of the crop factors differs between a tundra and a tropical rainforest? Are there multiple factors that change? If you chose any of our cropped factors, you're absolutely correct. In the real world, all of these factors are interconnected. Relief, for example, can influence climate and climate can influence the kinds of organisms that live in or on the soil. And no matter what parent material is present during a soil's formation, the soil type is still going to depend on the organisms present and the amount of time the soil has been forming, which depends on climate, which depends on relief. You can tell where we're going with this. Now, let's discuss why soils are so important. They are essential for all life under, in, and above the ground, they create many different ecosystems and provide habitats for all kinds of organisms, from the smallest scale to the largest. They also help control the quality of the atmosphere by absorbing pollutants and greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and releasing clean oxygen. Without soil, plants, and therefore animals, wouldn't be able to live or grow at all. We owe our entire existence to soil. But some soils are more productive than others. Remember our gelisol and oxisol examples? Neither of these are very productive for farming due to their various combinations of crops. The gelisol is too cold, and the oxisol doesn't have enough organic matter or nutrients. But what about a mollisol, which is a type of soil that forms under grasslands? Do you notice any differences between the mollisol, oxisol, and gelisol soil profiles? The dark brown color of both the gelisol and the mollisol indicates a high amount of nutrient-rich organic matter, which is great for plants. But only the mollisol would be good for farming, because the climate that gelisols form in is just too cold. The oxisol has almost no organic matter and therefore has very little potential to be productive, even though it forms in a warm and humid climate. Scientists can quantify the differences in soil productivity with several methods. Chemical analyses conducted in laboratories include the measurement of pH, or soil acidity, and cation exchange capacity, CEC for short, which is a measure of nutrient availability in the soil. But there are plenty of other analyses that don't need a lab, and you can try these at home on your own. To determine the amount of clay in a soil, we can do what's called the ribbon test. First, put a small amount of soil in your hand, and then add just a little bit of water, enough to wet the soil, but not enough to make mud. Then, roll the soil into a ball in your hands and pinch the ball between your thumb and your pointer finger. Now squeeze it to make a ribbon. As you can see, soils with more clay content form longer ribbons. If you were to try this with pure clay, your ribbon would be very long. Another test you can do at home is to look at soil color. In a lab, scientists do this with an official book called the Munsell Soil Color Chart, but you don't need one to try this. Instead, we can do it just by noticing what general color your soil is. 
If your soil is more reddish or orange, we know it has more oxides, so it formed in a high oxygen environment. If your soil is more gray or green, we know it formed in a low oxygen environment, like a bog. If your soil is super dark brown and black, like potting soil, it means it has lots of organic matter. Plants love this stuff. Here's a red, oxide-rich soil that we analyzed for color using the book. Analyses like these allow soil scientists to assess a region for agricultural stability and productivity, and determine both how the region's climate has changed through time and how a region will respond to further change in climate. Without healthy soils, we don't have healthy ecosystems. And without healthy ecosystems, our planet, and all the creatures that live on it, big and small, is in trouble. Therefore, it is vital that more people learn about and appreciate soil science. Thanks for listening! We hope you enjoyed the video, and if you want to learn more, check out the resources and references in the description.